Acts chapter 18 in your Bibles, please. We're looking at, um, well now we're down to Paul, how he is led by the Holy Spirit in his witness as a Christian. Um, we're not covering every detail, but we've come to Acts chapter 18 where Paul now goes to Corinth. He's been in various cities, uh, he's left Athens and he goes to Corinth. And what we're noticing, or what I'm noticing, is that Paul, in his work as a Christian um, preacher and teacher, it's a roller coaster ride. One moment he's up, the next moment he's down. And uh, I remember the first time I ever went on a roller coaster when the kids were small. Um, Tim was quite a young boy, and we went to American Adventure, and they went on various degrees of roller coasters. And they were all saying, "Dad, come on, come on, get on the roller coaster." And there was the Iron Wolf, if ever you've been to the Adventure Land, and it used to loop the loop, and I thought, oh, I just don't fancy that. Uh, and it was about ten minutes before the place was shutting. I thought, okay, I'll go on. And went on, and as it's cranking up, I'm thinking, what on earth am I doing here? But what? It was brilliant. <laughs> Looping the loop is brilliant. So I can now master on tap. I never did the, um, that demon drop and all that sort of stuff. Well, what's that, that one that goes to Oblivion? Never did Oblivion. Um, that's just a step too far. But I'm, I'm sure Paul, that's how he experienced it. You know, the, the, the effort, and, and it is quite a struggle, he's combating against people who opposed him. And then he's just actually, things are happening incredibly, and just doors are opening up and people are getting saved. And that is Paul's experience, and it might be salutary for us to remember it, that uh, his experience, that he's got success, then he's being strongly opposed, People welcome him, then other people scorn him or reject him, abuse him. Sometimes he has to hide because people are after him. Other times he escapes without anybody noticing. He's been imprisoned, but other times there's a miraculous escape. Sometimes he's before the authorities and nothing happens. Another time he's before the authorities and he lands up with a beating. Um, he's eager to preach wherever he goes. But then sometimes he feels the Holy Spirit restraining him. No, you can't do that. You've got to go somewhere else. And the poor man is all over the place. And he's come to Corinth. And I'm, I'm speculating. I think, I, I wonder what's going to happen to Corinth. <laughs> going his track record in, in the other places. What, what is it going to be like here? And in it, um, the Lord gives this strengthening word. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. Because when he came to Corinth, if we read the letter that he later wrote to the church, he says, I came to you in fear, much fear, and trembling, and weakness. And I think if you've been imprisoned and beaten and had to run for your life and all this sort of thing, you, know, you don't walk in and go, oh, I can handle this. I think, oh, what is going to happen? And he says, when I came to you, I was a bit, you know, a measure of fear and trepidation as I begin my ministry here. And this chapter in Paul's life gives us a remarkable turn of events. Things are happening, but in the middle of it, he does have this vision from the Lord who just encourages us and says, don't be afraid, keep on speaking, I'm with you, nobody's gonna harm you. He might be thinking, shall I have a holiday? Is it, is it the summer break, <laughs> you know? Have I earned myself a rest from all this? And the Lord said, no, just keep going. Just keep going. And so I've called this, my, my address this morning, <coughs> Preach It. And it's the, the Pentecostal Preach It Bra. You know, that's it. come on, uh, you don't do that here. Um, we might be grateful for that. We went, Fiona and I went to a church in Thetford, the uh, church on the way. And there was a, a um, preacher from Africa who came over. And quite a few Pentecostal churches came to hear him. And they sat behind us. And when he was preaching, all the time, preach it, brother, amen, tell it like it is, hallelujah, amen, come on, brother, amen, pray it, pray. The whole time we felt like, will you shut up? <laughs> <laughs> but I sense that's what the Lord is saying to us this morning. It's if he's saying, come on, share the word. Don't hold back, don't be silent. Come on, tell it how it is. Chapter 18. In Corinth, he experiences the same roller coaster 
experience. He finds two fellow travellers, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, there for him. He goes into the preach in the synagogue, they're against him. So then he goes next door, because he finds the owner of that house is for him. And then he has his vision that the Lord, he is for him. But then the Jews are against him and take him off to, uh, off to the magistrate's court. And then, surprise, surprise, he finds that this unbelieving magistrate, um, he's for him as well and throws the case out of court. So, um, some interesting things happen. Let's take it. Chapter 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a, a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. And every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. The Jews had been expelled from Rome, and there's a bit of debate about actually why. Um, quite a few commentaries that I've read. It's, it's, it's actually um, because of the, the trouble Christians were call, causing. Some people say it was because of Crestus, and they say Crestus, he was a, a rebel rouser, a revolutionary. But some people take that as a distortion of the word Christ. And one of the ideas is that amongst the Jewish population, some were becoming believers, and this was causing such a confusion and, and a, 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 a riot and all sorts of things, that they said, oh, all the Jews out. Um, however it happened, Aquila and Priscilla are out of Rome and they've, they've come to, uh, to Corinth. And I want to say three things this morning. And I'm, I'm taking as my mandate what, what Paul says, uh, what, what Luke says in verse 23, that Paul went to travel from place to place throughout the region, strengthening all the disciples. So this isn't a word, if, if you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian, um, I'm not going to outline the gospel, but it is about us, our ministry, our, our witness as Christians. And I want us to be strengthened by this word. And the first thing I want to say is to find a mate. Will you please find a mate? <laughs> not necessarily, uh, Christine's excited now, come on. <laughs> not necessarily to marry, I don't mean in that sense. But somebody to work with. This seems to be, to, to be the, the model that is most su uh, uh, successful. To recognise the people the Lord brings into our lives that we can work with. See, Aquila and Priscilla, the supposition is they're already Christians and they come to Rome. Um, just the circumstances of them being expelled and having to live somewhere else. The Lord takes that, and a very strong partnership comes about between Aquila and Priscilla and, and Paul. And it was this disturbance in Rome that precipitated this. Now, uh, we're familiar with riots in this country. Um, unfortunately, there have been some in inner cities. We're not so familiar with uh, riots for religious reasons, as in... It may be internal conflict within the Jewish community in Rome that this Jesus, it, it, it causes such, uh, such a division that eventually the authorities say, well, Jews all out. Whether you're Christian or not, just go out. And, it, and they arrive at Corinth. And Paul, it says here, Paul went to see them. He was a tent maker, as they were, and he stayed at work with them. Interesting aside there, that the, the rabbis wouldn't charge for their teaching, preaching. So that they do it, they work for themselves. And Paul, when he writes to the company, he said, I work day and night not to be a burden on you. So he supported himself. Elsewhere, Paul does teach that actually um, those who, particularly teachers, uh, those who have ministry, it's not wrong to support them. It does talk about double honour. And some people interpret that as double pay, which I quite like, but never mind, we'll leave that one. <laughs> <laughs> but having been thrown together, Paul on his journey, Aquila and Priscilla from 
Rome, they find a bond. They're both tent makers, but, the, but there's something that joins them together. And they become travelling companions with Paul. We, 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 uh, through him. They went to Ephesus and then Paul left them in <coughs> Ephesus. I'm just going to quote uh, what, what, what Paul says about them. When he wrote to the church in Rome, he mentioned Priscilla and Aquila, and, and he says in chapter 16, he says, um, verse 3 and 5, where we go here? Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. This is what he said, they risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. He found here people that really they bonded together. And if we're going to complete our mission, if we're going to be effective, we do need to find a mate that we can work with. When Jesus sent out the disciples, how did he send them out? Two by two. And it's not meant to be a one-man band, a one-man mission. You need people that you can turn to, that you can support one, one another. And I've just put down a note here. Uh, I'm just going to say it. And if people do form close bonds, don't get jealous about it. I say, oh, you know, they seem to be very close. People need to be very close in small groups. And it's, it's obvious with Paul, that Quill and Priscilla were very precious to him. There were other, loads of other people, but these were the two people that he bonded with. That's the first thing, find a mate. Second thing I want to say is, sow where it will grow. Put your seed where it will grow. Verse 5. When Silas and Timothy uh, came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. When the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own hands. I'm clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue, went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worship of God, Crispus, the synagogue ruler, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptised. <coughs> Taking the parable of the sower, we know some fell on the rock, some on a hard path, some in good soil, some amongst the thorns and thistles. An idiot only keeps sowing the seed on a hard path and on a rock. Some might land there because you're scattering your seed, but you don't plan to sow your seed on the rocky ground or in the, on the path. And Paul, he, he went to the synagogue, as we've noticed he, he's done, just sharing his faith, um, teaching about Jesus Christ. But when they became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest. That's it. What's the point? If you're, if you're not going to be reasonable, if you're not even going to be sit down and let's have a discussion, if you're going to be abusive. And it is. It's what Jesus said as well. If they don't receive you, what are we meant to do? Shake the dust off. Now you see people say, oh, but everybody, everybody, yes. Paul says, I've discharged my responsibility. You'll put me on your own hands. I went. But if you're not going to receive, I'm not just going to keep hammering and hammering and hammering. The Holy Spirit will. But I'm not going to... Well, one of the things we realised, Jim and I, in our Christian ministry, is that, um, let, let's say the devil. Um, but one of the enemy's tactics is to bring people into our life who will drain us and use up our time and resources and they don't receive the word of God. And you're just trying to put seed in hard ground or rocky ground and they just want your time, your attention, just to soak you dry. And, it's, and there needs to come a time when you shake off the dust off your feet, shake off your clock and say, okay, if you're not going to receive it, I'm going to go to people who will. So he went next door. Because <laughs> he knew there was something that was favourable, the God favour. Let me go where my ministry is going to, you know, people are going to receive the word with, with joy. And the incredible thing is, the leader of the synagogue from there comes next door and is a believer and is baptised and his whole house with him. So 
out of what was seen an apparently barren land, he'd been in the synagogue, but actually somebody somewhere received the word. And he has this incredible experience of baptizing. We, 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 we can't understand what that means. Let me give you a, another example. So referring back to the skeleton army, there was a man called Charles Jeffreys, and he was a prominent member of the skeleton army in London, in Ram Whitechapel, where the Salvation Army started. And he used to go to Salvation Army meetings and purposely disrupt them. He was aggressive, abusive. He wanted to dis you know, stop the Salvation Army. Then he got converted. And he, he went into the training. He became an officer. And in the end, he land, he, he, his, his, his work finished as he was in charge of the Salvation Army work in this country. He'd been a missionary in China and in Australia. And then this man who was opposed, so violently opposed, is actually converted. And that's what happened with Crispus. You know, the, the synagogues, we, we, we listen, but we're, we're not persuaded. But actually, Crispus was. And it says, him and his whole household believed in the Lord. That's why in, when Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he says, I, I, I wasn't sent to baptise. We're not against baptism, but that wasn't my particular ministry. But I did baptise. But I did baptise Crispus. Why? He's a key man. If the lead of the synagogue is actually now a believer in Jesus, the influence he's got. So where it will grow. That means we do go, we, we do go to every field that we can, but actually we need that discernment, we need that leading of the Holy Spirit. Where, where am I going to invest my time? Where am I going to, to share the word? I'll give it to all, because all need to hear, but I need to find where God is specifically directing me to, 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 to put the word in. Let me, last thing I want to say, speak out. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. So the wonderful thing that we have about our Lord is that he knows our needs before we know them. He has already prepared what we need so that we can succeed. Just a night time, Paul thinking things through. I'm sure because of what the Lord says, he was thinking, uh, you know, should I keep going? Shall I take this holiday? Yeah, are things getting a bit dodgy? Am I pushing it too far? And what the Lord says to him, now, don't be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. You were thinking of being silent, Paul? <laughs> what did I call you to do? Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to uh, attack you or harm you. I've got a very good book at home, which, uh, pulling it out of the shelf, I, I really need to read again. And I'll tell you the title of it, and we'll all say he does need to read it again. But it's called Leadership, um, by Philip Greenslade. And I've often referred to it, um, just talking about any role of leadership of family, um, wherever we're, we've got responsibility. And he talks about looking for the white water. So on the river, you're looking ahead because the white water signifies rocks. So now you need to take action. How are you going to negotiate? What are you going to do to prepare? It's not, oh, we're in rough water. You knew it was coming. And the Lord does that. He looks ahead and it just says, and says I'm going to give you something to prepare you before you get there. See, Paul's past experience, um, he's been thrown out of synagogues loads of times. He's been imprisoned, he's been beaten. Caught in Corinth, God, what shall I do? And what does the Lord say? Just keep on doing what you've been doing all the time. Don't be afraid. No fear. And we read the story, and a beating or a flogging was a serious thing. And the Lord is saying, no, don't be afraid of that. In fact, Jesus says, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. Rather fear him who can kill the soul in hell. 
Don't be, don't be afraid of that. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. Paul, I've given you a responsibility. You have to discharge it. The results are not your responsibility. The responsibility is to proclaim the word. And that's why he says to the, to the synagogues, I'm shaking, you know, I'm shaking my cloak and shaking the dust off my uh, sandals. Now, I've, I've, my conscience is clear. I've, I've, I've delivered what was on my heart. So keep on speaking. Do not be silent. And then, I've mentioned a few weeks ago, the Great Commission, and we love that promise, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's tied in with that commission. Go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. Then I am with you. And here Paul, get, here's that word again. Just keep speaking, and I am with you. And no one's going to attack you or harm you. Why? Because Corinth is a key place. It was a huge, um, my, my notes said, uh, what did I write down? About 120,000 people. Cosmopolitan, very rich, uh, very liberal in its morals as well. But but the Lord says, uh, keep going because I've got many people in this city. So he stayed for a year and a half, which for Paul was a, was a long time. Just this little incident. He says, no one's going to harm you. I'm with you. You know, you'll, you'll be safe. And then he's arrested again. <laughs> oh, dear. The Jews. Oh, I thought God. I thought you said I'm going to be safe. No one's going to harm me. And then it, it says um, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him into court and brought marched him to the magistrate with this accusa accusation. He's persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. And Paul is just about to defend himself, as he's quite capable of doing, when Gallio said to the Jews, and he's the magistrate. He's the authority. I'll read it. If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names of your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he had them ejected from the court. Case was thrown out. It, it's not an illegal act. It's the Jews arguing about theology again. Sort it out yourself. There's an unfortunate tale piece. Um, because Crispus, he was the synagogue leader, he's become a Christian, so his place has been replaced by Sosthenes, is that how you say his name? So uh, he has instigated this charge against Paul, taking him off to the magistrates. Come on, magistrate, deal with this Paul. Uh, no, case thrown out. So he had them ejected from the court, then they all turned, oh, poor old Sosthenes. Then they all turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler, and beat him in front of the court. Galileo showed no concern whatsoever. She was just scorning the eyes themselves. We've just sung. You're the defender of the weak who comfort those in need. We need to understand what that means. Because here's this comforting word from the Lord. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. I am with you. No one's going to harm you. And to be comforted by the Lord means not... We do, we do get the sympathetic arm around the shoulder and all that, you know, I understand. But to be comforted by the Lord is to be strengthened. Strength will rise as we wait on the Lord. To keep going. Because the Lord has many people in that city, I need somebody to proclaim it. There's another whole study about Apollos. He, he had a, a, quite an influence in Corinth. His story comes a bit later on. Um, but at the moment, Paul is, mount, uh, Paul is, is the Lord's mouthpiece. I'm going to finish just by commenting on how Paul saw himself. He says to the Corinthian church, When I came to you, I came in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My, listen to this. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. talking with Patrick on Friday morning and I'm aware that you, you mention radical preachers, you're on thin ice because of the effect the harm uh, the evil that is 
permeated through some radical preachers. Paul was a radical preacher. He went in and caused real mayhem, both the Jews and the Greeks. And the problem we've got as Christians is that we're called to preach the word. And preachers have got a bad name. And I, if I'm meeting people, I say, yeah, I'm a preacher. And we've been talking. I, I, I love street preaching as well. I'd love to be on the streets preaching. But we've got a huge hurdle to overcome now. And I, I used to think that, well, in the King James Version, it, it used to say that God chose to save people through the foolishness of preaching. That's how it that's said. And people, and I know in this church we joke about preaching, people think that preaching is a foolish thing. Actually, it doesn't say that. In, the, in the, our translation now, it says, Since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. And there's two things. The message we preach is a message of weakness. That we're talking about Jesus Christ crucified on the cross. This whole picture of the, the, the Saviour laying down his life. What Paul says, so in weakness, raised in power. But we have the message of the cross to preach, which to many is foolishness and weakness. And also the messenger is weak. That's what Paul said. My men, it wasn't, I, I wasn't persuasive words and wise, oh, I'm, I can wrap people up in arguments, I can tie, I can answer every question. What does he say? It, it was, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. The messenger is actually weak. Where is the power? in the Word of God. And I, I want to encourage us as a church to take every opportunity to share the Word of God directly. We're doing a lot of indirect evangelism. We're coming alongside people. We're sharing our lives. We're doing good. I just feel in my, in my spirit that we, we need doors of opportunity where directly the word of God, the seed of life can be planted into lives that are open to receive it. And the demonstration of the Spirit's power, um, talk about healing, talk about miracles, about gifts, of interpretation, prophecy, discerning spirits, all that sort of stuff. When, when the message of the cross is preached, the demonstration of the Spirit's power is in lives that are converted. That's the Spirit's power. And every one of us who have been converted, who are a, a, a disciple of Jesus Christ, that's a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Who can change the heart of a person except God? And it is this Word of God, that's why earlier we were singing, there's a sword in our, uh, at our side. This, the living Word, not, a, not an academic study, but the, the revelation of the Word of God, it's the power to change. <coughs> Find somebody that you can work with. And it, that happens already, but if, if not, find somebody. We'll finish. But people have had various initiatives. When Anita was with us, uh, with, uh, with Hazel. Didn't she go with you with Hazel? Doing some door to door? I don't think she's done that in the past. I'm not saying you've got to do that. We've had initiatives out on the marketplace. Don't go and stand in the marketplace by yourself. But find somebody you can work with. And actually, where can we find good soil? To plant this seed. Wherever it is. Get in partnership. Jane in school. And I know she's in partnership with other uh, believers. But we need to be working together. Where we can serve. Find a mate. Find the place where you should be investing your time. Where you should be giving your work. You need to know what you're talking about. Good seed planted into. And it might seem unpromising at the beginning. I could give you stories from prison that I, I won't. But it might seem unpromising. And then suddenly, the synagogue leader becomes a believer because somebody took the trouble to plant that seed of word. 
Don't be silent. Religion, Christian faith is not a private matter. We need, this town needs people who will boldly proclaim the word. That's my message this morning. Amen.